Thank you. Alrighty. Hi, hi everybody. My name is Aaron Volkman. How's everybody feeling this afternoon after lunch? Is everybody feeling DevOpsy? Is everybody feeling maybe DevSecOpsy? Well, I hope that this might increase the uh, feeling here. I'll be talking today about requirements gathering for a successful DevOps, DevSecOps implementation. Um, so just to roll the slides on, uh, please focus your attention on the screens here. This is gonna be the most important slide of the day. All right, here we go. Uh, just to go over what I'm gonna talk about, uh, a little bit of background about who I am and where I come from, some common pitfalls that we've seen with our customers implementing a secure DevOps pipeline, go over what we do to conduct a current state assessment, we go over requirements analysis, evaluation, we'll talk about people, process, platform, and also uh, security uh, requirements gathering for automated integrated development pipeline. So for just a little bit of background about me and where I come from, obviously the US, but I come from Software Engineering Institute, federally funded research shop run by Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, has anybody in the room here heard of uh, CMM or CMMI? Oh, a lot of people here. So that's what we, my company got famous for, but that's sort of in our past. And now we do a lot of research and practice and software development, uh, acquisition and maintenance, mainly for the United States federal government and military. Uh, my groups assisted numerous government organizations in modernizing their software development practices. And uh, trust me, they really needed it and uh, in this, all in the spirit of DevOps principles. And uh, I work for CERT, the, originally the Computer Emergency Response Team, and we're all about security, so everything we touch, we have a security flavor to, and it uh, fits in very well with our sponsor because application security is their number one quality attribute, attribute whenever uh, they put out software or acquire software. So, uh, Common question that we get is, how can I implement? How can I bring DevOps in to my shop and have a secure DevOps? My team or my directorate, project, organizational unit, uh, wherever. Uh, a lot of the questions are, you know, how do I assess the current state? Where am I now? That's what we do a lot of help uh, doing, and hopefully, I'll be able to power level y'all in doing the same thing in your own organizations. Uh, where are the productivity bottlenecks? Uh, whom to train on what? Uh, I wish everybody could be a generalist, but it requires a lot of specialized skills and a lot of growth, and organizations end up changing who they are as the result of a DevOps transformation. So uh, our, uh, our friends need help in uh, training and knowing what skill sets they need what and how to measure so that we know that we're being successful and finally how to monitor on an ongoing basis so that we know uh, what we're doing is working for us. Who here in the room? Uh, so I'm a developer. I've been a developer for the past like 17 years at least, getting paid money to do so. And so whenever uh, quality things happen, I take it very, very uh, personally since I'm on the front lines. Uh, but it also encompasses uh, you know, an entire team in the organization, uh, security folks, IT operations, quality assurance, and even business analysts. But uh, I look to the Rugged Manifesto as an inspiration. Who here has heard of Rugged Software? Quite a few of you, so I'm not gonna go too much, but here's the Rugged Manifesto. It's similar to the Agile Manifesto. I think of it as, you know, me as a developer being the prize fighter, looking before a fight, looking in the mirror, pumping myself up. Okay, soft, I've highlighted the key words here. Software is foundation of our modern world. We have a responsibility that comes. Uh, we're, we will be attacked by adversaries who threaten national security, refuse to be a source of vulnerability or weakness. We face these challenges and persist, and it's very necessary to be rugged. You can go and look at ruggedsoftware.org. This was started by Josh Corman with the help of Dave Rice and Jeff Williams. But is this sort of a, uh, it's not a uh, SDLC or methodology, but it's a set of values to aspire to. And I think uh, DevOps and DevSecOps with the automation helps us get there. 
Um, so I'm going to go over some common pitfalls. Take note of this slide. A lot of our customers come needing help because these transformations are not easy. And I'll share with you some of the things through our research and our customer engagements that we found uh, were a little bit of a problem for them. So what went wrong? The belief that DevOps is a fad or a fashion. I know that DevOps is a big buzzword and perhaps the buzzword won't stay around, but uh, as a concept, I think it will live on forever because it makes sense. Uh, within the US military sense, a couple of generals went and visited Google and Amazon and saw what they were doing with DevOps. And they said, we need this, this is the du jour. A lot of pe so we're going to start doing DevOps now in order to reduce costs and do better at putting out software within the U.S. government. Uh, a lot of people detractors from that said this is just fashion or it's just a fad or a trend. Uh, I think that's wrong. Believe me, this is not going away. Another thing that what, another thing that can go wrong is that it's only about tools, only about tooling that you can buy it, that it's a product. Uh, we have lots of vendors that are sponsoring us out there, so I'm not going to cut down any tools. But a big mistake is thinking that uh, thinking that you can purchase DevOps and have solve all your problems with the product. It's more something that must happen from within, uh, change-wise. Another mistake is the only thing about in terms of it's only about Dev and Ops. It also has to do with uh, security, the business, legal. It encompasses all the stakeholders that touch the software. Uh, another thing that goes wrong is that DevOps is the same for our organization. So what works for me, you can carbon copy that and it might work for you. That's very much not the case. Even within one organization, the same principles and practices that work for one team um, do not necessarily work for another team so that you could have many different flavors of the rainbow of DevOps going on all under one roof in one organization. Mistakes is the only thing with DevOps is only about CI and CD. That's definitely a core component of it, but that is also uh, a mistake. And another mistake is to turn DevOps into a new, new organizational unit where it creates a new business silos. I've gone into a lot of shops where I'm introduced to the DevOps team and the DevOps engineers. It's very, I see DevOps uh, teams and engineers as change agents within an organization to get us from point A to point B, but uh, DevOps must, in order to be successful, must be embedded uh, throughout the organization and with all of us. Moving on, what we currently do when we first start talking to an organization while doing DevOps is assessing their current state, and I'll walk you through that. Put a lot of work into developing this. We have a 200, a 50 page questionnaire with hundreds of questions. Whenever I go in, I'm very embarrassed to ask some of them of certain people because it's just so numerous, but it's a good uh, framework to get to know organization and be able to start talking about how we can change for the better. Uh, basically, it starts with interviewing team lead team members from the key areas related to application developers, application development, uh, that means uh, security, ops, business, dev. Uh, by interview, we don't mean assessing their strengths and weaknesses and asking, you know, uh, what's your uh, big, biggest weakness as a professional? No, it's getting to know them and getting to know their work. We do a review, uh, we val do a validation of statements. Uh, we've learned that you can't necessarily look at written policy and uh, look at a document and say, oh, this is what we do. And, uh, and often when the rubber hits the road, uh, organizations do something very, very different in reality. A lot of organizations say they do agile just because whenever everybody happens to be in the office on the same day, they get up and have a stand-up meeting, you know, every once in a while, something like that. Um, demonstrations of software tools used for automation of software development and deployment so that we can understand what the current practice is. Um, try to gain a cultural perspective related to the de development evolution and the security team. This is sort of looking at the history so that we understand why they're doing the things today that 
they're doing now because usually there's a cultural reason or you know there's a, usually a rhyme to the reason on why things are the way they are now and that can help us shape uh, how to transform going forward into the future and we also do a uh, review of their legal concerns their risk management process uh, to all their stakeholders so uh, in order to conduct this uh, assessment, first things first, we have to agree on definitions between us and the customer, whether or not we're gonna say DevOps or call it DevSecOps or Sec DevOps and process. Uh, interestingly, I deal with the United States military a lot and I went into a room talking about, oh, we have to get developers and operate, operations in the same room and collaborate and a lady raised her hand and said, um, my operations are on a ship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You know, they're not going to get together, even though those ships might have server rooms on them. But uh, just to like sort of dig into that, uh, page Roman numeral X of the Joint Publication 1 of the Doctrine of the Armed Forces of the United States defines operations as a sequence of tactical, tactical actions with a common purpose or unifying theme. An operation may entail the process of carrying on combat, including movement, supply, attack, defense, and maneuvers needed to achieve the objective of any battle or campaign. So based on that definition, whenever I talk about operations, they're thinking uh, gun, soldier, out in the field, where what we think of as operations is more what they call a function. So it's very important to get on a common vocabulary with your customer. And I found that it's a lot easier for us as outside consultants to change our vernacular to match the customer rather than try to re-educate an entire huge organization. Um, next step, identify the key stakeholders. I went over that a, a few times. Uh, conduct interviews of each team. Identify and analyze their current technical tool stack. Uh, collect key metrics and establish measurement frameworks. Identify the gap areas and develop a roadmap on how to get to their nirvana state. And uh, then select the suitable project, the suitable project to start with their implementation with to build that piece of software, that certain project, learn from it and evaluate, evaluate what works and what doesn't work so that they can then expand throughout their organization. So to dr drill into each of these, the assessment process conduct interviews with the teams, getting to know them. With a development team, the, depending on the size, I can get to know them pretty well in a couple hours, just you know, walking them through, especially if they're using technologies that I'm familiar with. Um, we like to conduct anonymous surveys of them to ask them how they feel about working with other teams, uh, particularly between QA and dev, because historically they have a lot of contention very, very important to make this not electronic. Uh, I come from the corporate world over in the US and many a times I've been, uh, managers have tried to seduce me on filling out answers on a SharePoint page where it says, welcome Aaron, please tell us how you feel. We swear it's anonymous and it's like, I'm not gonna be too uh, forthcoming there. So we usually do these kinds of things on paper. We analyze the, the outcomes from their current practices we give them feedback and then we uh, brief the executive team. Uh, it's a very bottom up process starting with the folks at the ground level who are closest to the work, but it, it has to roll its way up to the executive team because as we know, without uh, leadership buy-in, without executive buy-in, since they have the scratch, it's very, very important to gain uh, the executive buy-in. Next step is to identify the stakeholders. Um, these are a lot of the issues or uh, aspects in the center of all of this is developers. Very, since I'm a developer, very near and dear to my heart. All uh, concerned with uh, performance tuning, actually doing the programming, doing development testing, applying updates, conducting code reviews. Uh, IT operations, they're concerned with the scalability the infrastructure, the deployment of the software, the ongoing net, uh, maintenance, taking care of the networks, 
uh, applying updates after it's in production. Then we have information security, doing monitoring, uh, uh, conducting application security reviews, keeping a look to make sure that we're covered, uh, conducting intrusion detection. Then we have quality assurance, who is in charge of maintaining technical documentation in many organizations, conducting testing, doing user documentation, release reviews. And uh, I put them last since they're not as smart as the developers, but they're very, very important, the uh, business analysts. Uh, they're very, uh, they know about the business constraints. They're often the closest to the money. So having their buy-in is extremely important and getting the, uh, their feedback. So I'm gonna go into each of these areas and uh, dive into a little bit of what we talk about. We want to really understand how they develop their requirement. Oh, and another thing, especially with business analysts, I found that whenever I'm interviewing them and talking about DevOps, this turns into a two-way thing where I start giving them ideas on the possibilities and the things that they should be really focused on where perhaps in the past they weren't because they've been driven by their business customers. But uh, look at their how they develop their requirements and how they manage their requirements. Um, we want to make sure that they're not missing security requirements because that's very, very bad. We want to be able to bake in security up front. Also, the business analysts have a role in convincing the customer or their management to fund security user stories and to bake that in. Uh, we have to understand the acquisition and contracting process. By acquisition, I mean either buying commercial off the shelf uh, products or um, subcontracting a contractor to build custom software for us. Uh, we need to understand the verbiage that's used, the requirements that are used, and we need to help them to structure future contracts because if we have external contractors building software for us, we want them to use our secure DevOps pipeline and utilize our automation, our automated testing. And a big gap right now that the government faces is not having that um, that part in the contracts. A lot of the current contracts say, uh, I've met my goal, I've dumped the software on you. It might not work, but I've, through our the way the contract is, we've met our goal and we've checked the box. Uh, we need to understand the risk management process, uh, how much risk we can tolerate versus how much money we wanna spend on trying to reduce that risk. Um, if ri the risk management folks are siloing themselves, we see this as uh, equally bad as being siloed in dev or ops. Uh, we have to understand their compliance requirements. Uh, with our customer, uh, the US government, their compliance requirements are huge, huge, and there's a tremendous amount of work in uh, my company and others on trying to find shortcuts on how to uh, optimize and streamline compliance requirements. But being able to understand that up front helps us automate our way into doing the best we can to help fulfill those compliance requirements through our DevOps pipeline. Also, we wanna know how the projects are planned and tracked, how the money's allocated, et cetera. Move on to assess the developer, of course. We want to understand their development methodology, if they're using agile, waterfall, safe, extreme programming, lean, my personal favorite, cowboy coding. Just kidding. Um, well, you might say, oh, how can I do waterfall in uh, DevOps? I think it is possible if we can change our requirements fast enough. I don't know if we really want to do that or have some amalgamation of it. I know IEEE is working on recommendations on how to do waterfall in DevOps, so keep a look out there. We want to understand their development environments, what tools they use, what programming languages they use. We want to understand how they do their task assignment, their management, their issue trackers. Uh, we're really interested in what their definition of done is. I've noticed that in a lot of shops, the first thing to go whenever uh, the schedule starts to creep up is automated testing and you get skimped on because uh, that's something that the customer doesn't directly see but uh, ends up be, being uh, to bite them later on is to skimp on automated testing. So uh, it's very interesting to us to 
uh, learn what the definition of done is for a particular task and be sure to uh, enforce that automated testing and security testing are baked into that. You also need to want to understand their level of collaboration with other internal and external teams and see you know, how they connect. Um, and another thing that I'd like to understand is how are the teams incentivized to follow the processes? If, um, if somebody, if uh, they're required to put in commit messages uh, so that they, in, whenever they commit to source control and connect that to an issue in their issue track, or if they don't do that, then what, what happens? Do they have any incentive to do that or to not do that? And looking at uh, quality assurance, we look at their software testing methodologies and what technologies they use there. Uh, we look at how they do software assurance as well as quality assurance. We take a look at how they do compliance verification and ask about their audit requirements. If they're in the US, they might have HIPAA requirements that they deal with uh, health safety data, if they're PCI compliant, if they're dealing with payment card data. Uh, things like that, because that all feeds into what activities we have to uh, instrument in our DevOps pipeline. We also have to understand how they give feedback to the development team and how that interaction takes place. Um, next thing that we assess is the deployment release process. We understand how the, their software configuration management works how their integration process works, whether or not they do it on a build server, whether or not they hire somebody else to do it for them, whether or not they do it on the lead developer's laptop, copy it to a thumb drive, and then pray that it works. We uh, want to look at their software verification and validation process, the software review and audit process, and uh, how they secure their deployment pipeline. Um, having a secure deployment pipeline is crucial to uh, having an auditable and assuring that they know exactly what source code contributed to an executable that's in production. And it also mitigates insider threats. So securing the deployment pipeline is very important and making sure that only uh, they have appropriate access controls to that. And assessing IT operations. We look at their operational process and how they manage updating uh, software in production. We want to know uh, what kind of team engagement they have, uh, how they, the policy knowledge management, how they know, keep track of the institutional knowledge of uh, how they do things and how that's communicated to various team members to make sure that they, there's uh, no Brent effect from the Phoenix project happening where there's some genius in the back that if he was hit by a bus, the whole house of cards would come tumbling down. We need to take a look at their asset management. We need to make sure that we need to understand if there's an IT operational policy blocking developers from using open source software or something of the like and how we can possibly mitigate that going forward. Look at their IT governance and how their change control process and how they authorize changes to be made. Uh, we look at their service management, their SLAs. Also look at the audit and monitoring and ask about that. Moving on to information security. Uh, we look at the management and auditing of the software supply chain. You know, as we all know, you know, our, uh, the software we build today is sort of like Lego blocks where we have lots of commercial off the shelf pieces and libraries being glued together and integrated. Um, how do we audit that supply chain of third party stuff being downloaded rampantly off the internet? Uh, we look at the security controls that are in place, the security uh, policies, uh, particularly their compliance requirements, you know, what standard they have to be held to, to in order to uh, comply with their uh, specific context. You know, how they do application security testing, if at all, uh, do their product security management and uh, security awareness training and knowledge management. Again, this goes back to looking at what information should be in a wiki somewhere and what information is being held in somebody's head where it's, it can't be shared by all and spread throughout the organization. Next thing we look at is 
the technology stack. I went over a few of these things in dev, when I was talking about the devs. Uh, the languages and tools they use, the IT solution stack, what kind of virtualization they use, what operating systems they support, uh, the enterprise support services, are there any cloud services that are helping, uh, their issue trackers, uh, things like that. Uh, any legacy systems that are placed, especially if they're integrated with the new things that we're developing. Uh, application development support tools, our Visual Studio, our Eclipse, our IntelliJ, our Vagrant, our Chef, our Puppet. Uh, the software reuse process, since we don't want to reinvent the wheel over and over again, we want to make uh, libraries that are developed by our developers able to be reused throughout the organization. So how are those things tracked and managed? and also uh, the accreditation approval process for all these technologies and tools that are, bringing, uh, that are uh, being brought in, um, as well as what we're releasing. And as far as accreditation goes, we need to decide if we need to do a full accreditation process with every change we make to the software. If we change our icon, the cornflower blue, do we have to go through a manual accreditation process or can we incrementally reach, achieve this by forming a baseline and then uh, performing a check of the deltas so that we know that the end result is uh, blessed. We're going to identify uh, metrics and measurement on how we can measure how well we're doing. Uh, we look at software metrics, things like uh, number of story points, uh, lines of code, which I don't think is very good. Maybe feature points or story points is a better measure. I think it probably depends on the context. Uh, quality metrics, number of defects being released. Um, the SEI has a thing called checkpoint diagnostic where we model a qualitative process baseline. Uh, we have a quantitative performance baseline where we measure things like uh, time, speed, number of features, defects, and uh, feed that into a model. And then we compare that against benchmarks where we've gathered data like this from various different contexts and we can let our customers know how they're doing versus these benchmark shops that we think are doing pretty good. Um, and, it's, and also define what the end goal means as being rugged, you know, what that means to all stakeholders for their given uh, spot in things. Uh, next step is identifying a suitable project. Um, select either a new or an existing project as a pilot. Uh, new ones are much easier to do since they're greenfield. Uh, ones that are good for a pilot are ones with the most stakeholders involved so that we have a large uh, surface area of uh, people with a stake in the game. One, we want a project that minimizes the risk to the business in case something goes haywire or, or if it inevitably slows down in release. Uh, we want the ability to learn, develop, and implement security in the process. And hopefully we want to take aspects out this and see what aspects of our pilot project can be scaled to the rest of the organization. And as I said before, and as I think we all know that uh, within a single organization, we could have, depending on technology, we could have a different, our DevOps in one team may look a little bit different from the DevOps in another team. Moving on, talk about the requirements, analysis, and evaluation. After we're done interviewing and gathering all this data, we, uh, we collaborate with all the team leads and we share the identified requirements all together with all the, all the teams at the table together in a room. And we together categorize and prioritize the requirements that we gathered and come up with a game plan on how to get started. I uh, found that these meetings can be a lot like marriage counseling where already we see DevOps start to take hold just because we're facilitating conversation between say development and quality assurance. And we develop a, a together we develop an implementation plan involving for the people, for the process, and for the platform, the three P's here. They're sort of the pillars of a rugged shop. Uh, you know, without the process, we have nothing to execute on the platform. Without people, we have nothing. 
Hopefully that will continue to be the case until we're all retired here. We don't have to worry about that anymore. We will not be automated away, something like that. But um, we want to, um, so as far as people goes, very important to understand that it's not just development, it's everybody's job. Everybody's a part of this, meaning, you know, in the generally in the four, in the uh, five areas that I showed, security, operations, business analysts, uh, and quality assurance. So to dive into people, we want heavy collaboration between all stakeholders. We want to be sure that they're focused on coming up with a secure design uh, through their architecture decisions. Architecturally, I think uh, the most important thing for DevOps is to architect so that what we're building is conducive to automated testing. Uh, we want to be sure that we have a secure environment and network configuration. We have uh, a plan to deploy our code securely, uh, conduct secure code reviews. Uh, this can be very uh, much a challenge because in most organizations, the devs up, outnumber the ops and the security folks. So it can be quite a challenge to bring security in. I know what Walmart does is they have a dev title called a security maven where uh, developers or operations folks that are particularly interested in security go and sort of hive up with security folks and they become uh, you know, low level representatives of security fo uh, teams and are able to you know, sort of spread the security knowledge throughout the organization that way. We make sure on the people side that we have constantly available and open communication channels. Uh, we make sure that somebody representing DevOps and security are all together in all project decision meetings. This is a way of shifting left security and making sure that we're baking it in the best we can from the beginning instead of trying to schlep it on at the end. We want to make sure that there's a uh, E communications as easy as possible with chat, email, and wiki services available to all team members. Interestingly, I found that on teams where everybody's uh, telecommutes and everybody's spread out, uh, that works out very well for using wikis and chat uh, because they're sort of forced to. Uh, a shop back home almost everybody works from home and they have a rule that if it's not in the wiki, then it didn't happen. If two people are together in a coffee shop and they have a conversation, that conversation must be documented in the wiki so that the whole team can see it or else, as far as the organization is concerned, it really, really didn't happen. So looking at the process, you want to establish a process to enable people to succeed using the platform develop secure software. The process is sort of the what we're going to do and the platform is how we're going to do it or our tool bench for making the process happen. We want to make sure that constant communication is visible to all. We want to ensure that tasks are testable and repeatable, hopefully through automation. We want to, with that automation, we want to free up our humans to do challenging creative work instead of the mundane. Uh, you want tasks to be performed with minimal effort and cost. We want to create confidence in our success after numerous repetitions. If we do something every single day, we know that tomorrow will probably work out okay, as opposed to doing things only a couple times a year. We want to achieve faster deployment and frequent high quality releases with our process. The platform, that's where the people use the process to build secure software. So platform involves having the tooling in place for automated environment creation provisioning. Um, this is where I'm talking about virtualization, our Docker, our chef, our puppet, things like that. Have automated infrastructure testing so we know these things are working, especially when we're apt to get installing packages off the internet or hopefully out of our uh, sequestered uh, enclave or our private repos. Uh, we want to make sure that we have parity between de development, QA, staging, and production environments so that we're assured that if it works in dev, it's very likely to work in the uh, future stages as well. 
Uh, we want to enable our platform so we can uh, use configuration scripts as a communication mechanism for sharing and versioning of environmental configurations and also to uh, be able to uh, use that to collaborate on it and uh, be able to have dev have a say and ops have a say in how a server is going to be configured, for instance. So just a little bit more about Rugged. It's a culture, it's not a tool, it's not a software development life cycle or an org structure. Rugged is not secure. Uh, security is only an instant in time because tomorrow there might be a z we're one zero, day away, uh, one zero day away from being insecure. And we all know that proactive security is better than reactive because reactive will eventually fail. Um, so, Rugged DevOps uh, we has a security culture where the developers and OpSecs collaborate. Um, developer, both developers and operations and uh, security support release, releases beyond deployment. Uh, they have access to the stakeholders who understand the business and the mission goals. Uh, we're performing security automation and measurement. We want to automate security of repetitive processes and error-prone tasks, build, testing, deployment, and maintain consistent environments. Uh, we want static and dynamic security analysis automation, which is, I think, a tr the, especially the dynamic. In order to do that without buying a very fancy tool is a huge uh, amount of effort goes into that. Uh, we want to be able to provide performance dashboards for visibility of that information. Uh, we want to be able to uh, streamline our secure pipeline uh, and uh, have continuous delivery practices. Let's see. And uh, secure system and architecture. An architecture that supports automated testing is the biggest thing on there. So next, just take a look at, this might be very familiar, but this is my version of the slide showing continuous integration and continuous deployment. We have our project team up in the corner. They're interacting mainly with our source code repository that contains the application code, our infrastructure code, our chef, our puppet scripts to build our servers or our Docker containers, as well as our uh, documentation, where the documentation lives in a source code repository alongside of the other artifacts. Um, we interact with that. We have our continuous integration server in the middle that does the build, the automated testing, the automated deployment. The automated testing, I think, is our biggest challenge and the biggest thing that gets skimped on since uh, that's the easiest thing to slack up on whenever the schedule starts to suffer. We have automated deployment to a production, to an area to give uh, customer visibility as well, and also to deploy to our QA team, all the while giving constant status and feedback to the project team. This slide's, it's not very much, I made a non-eye chart here. It used to be an eye chart until I blew it up. But this just shows the different various tools and how they should be integrating. At the center of the wheel, we have uh, source control, and we have our monitoring, our communication systems, our issue tracker, uh, all of our systems integrated uh, amongst all of these tools. Here's a view of a, all the tools and how the different interactions between them. On the left here, we have our human actions and inputs to the software development process, all the stuff that our human people are gonna do. Then we have this huge chunk of uh, things that could be performed by autonomous systems whenever they're properly integrated. You can download these slides later on to have a closer look-see at these. Anyway, that's about all the time I have. You can go and take a picture of this URL. This is our, my company's blog on DevOps. Take a look there for the latest on what we're doing. I'm not sure if I have time for uh, q and I have one question. No takers? That's my contact information. I'm Aaron Volkman. There's my Twitter, there's my email, there's my websites. Thanks for having me.